The song is over, so we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Grit and Glamour. My name is Ruby Veridiano, and tonight we're going to be talking about K-dramas. Now, if you're anything like me, during quarantine, I've become emotionally invested in Korean dramas, and I know I'm not alone. Uh, on Netflix, across the entire world, the top streaming content happens to be K-dramas. And as we all know by now, unless you're living under a rock, BTS, the K-pop group, has just explosively um, uh, exploded into the scene internationally, defying all language and cultural barriers. So we want I want to know, how, well, how did this happen? What is the secret? What is going on in Korean pop culture storytelling that's allowing these barriers to be broken in this phenomenal way? So today I have the fierce, the fabulous, ferocious firecracker, Michelle Mush Lee. She is the perfect person to help break this down because she is a storytelling expert. She is the founder of Whole Story Group. And she's also the cultural affairs commissioner for the city of Oakland. So as you can see, she has all the expertise to help us understand this phenomenon. Mush, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Rubes. It's Hi. so good to be here. Hey, everyone joining in. And tell us a little bit more about what you do and what your work at Whole Story Group does um, and also your role at the as a commissioner for the city of Oakland. Well, I am. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I am a poet. I'm a writer. Um, I run an organization called Whole Story. And basically, it's using storytelling and it's using it to connect people, um, not just in the artistic and creative spaces, but it's also about using storytelling in spaces that most people may not think um, it lives or it should live. So it should be in the workplace. It should be in the grocery store. It should be on the corner when you're chopping up with your friends. It should be in schools with young kids. It should be um, in tech. It should be in finance, in law. So basically wherever the story can live to help connect people together who think that they aren't connected or they have no, nothing in common, that's where I like to bring the story. So we are um, a leadership group. We are professional facilitators and trainers, and we do organizational and professional development training all around your story and all around how to bring your story out in a way that's real, that's authentic, and um, that allows you to connect to people across world and experiences. Right. You're a master storyteller. And I forgot to include in the introduction that you're also an HBO deaf poet. So, you know, just to add to more to that repertoire of yours. Um, <laughs> and so tell me a little bit more also about what you do at, as a um, arts uh, cultural commissioner um, at, at the city of Oakland. Yeah. So it, we, there's 11 of us and we were just, um, we just took our oath and it's the first time that the city of Oakland has had cultural affairs commissioners in the last decade or so. So it's basically there is, um, if you don't know about Oakland or if you don't know about California or you haven't been here yet, first of all, come check it out, come visit and we'll be friends. Um, but about 10 years ago, maybe even longer than that, but about 10 years ago, there was like this real cultural explosion. There was uh, an event called First Fridays that started really grassroots with a lot of local um, artists who are full-time independent working artists who came together and said, you know what? We wanna shut down the street every Friday, first Friday of every month. And we wanna bring out our merch. We wanna bring out our art. We wanna bring out all the things that make us dope. So we wanna create an economic footprint. We wanna have a marketplace, but we also want to be able to be true to our cultural um, identity like we want to come with spoken word we want to come with um, turf dancing we want to come with scraper bikes we want to come with um, all this all, all like the homemade jewelry fabric stuff geometric jewelry all the stuff that you see like at the dopest flea markets or at the dopest arts and craft festivals um, Oakland's artists came through and it started to gain a lot of north uh, notoriety across the country people started visiting um, and that kind of set the stage for 
Oakland to blow up as kind of an economic hub, not just a cultural engine, but a place where new businesses, tech leaders um, started investing and coming into Oakland. And as you know, that's like, it's crazy, right? When you have those kind of elements come into play. So there's a lot of um, complexity around that, but that's basically how it started. Um, And so Oakland is known now for its arts and culture and its strong cultural community. Um, And as a commissioner, I serve with 10 others and we basically make sure that the artist who have been around, the artists who are coming to the city have a real voice and a real stake in the resources that are around Uh, in um, in also, you know, the land um, that is being used and how cultural spaces are being preserved and also being grown. So with a lot of new development, when you have condos coming in, when you have new businesses and tech tech folks coming in, it's like, well, you have access to that resource and space if you're a corporate entity, but what about the cultural, what about the cultural purveyors who have been there for a long yes. time? How do we yes. not just get sidelined to doing the mural on the wall, uh, right? Because uh, <laughs> uh-huh. that's beautiful too. But how do we also have a really sturdy seat at the table where we're making decisions about where the resources get allocated and how much of those resources uh-huh. are really put back into the pockets of artists who are doing the work and not to necessarily invent or do something new that's outside of their vision and passion and heart. Uh-huh. But how can we seed and resource artists to do what they They've always done and to do it even better. So yes. that's, a long that's way of such saying, like, important work. I love that you're doing that. And I love that the city of Oakland has set that up because I mean, Oakland is such a special place in my heart. And I believe that 100% that what makes Oakland special is really the artists and the Oakland culture. Um, there's nothing in the world like it. Uh, I and mean, where else are you going to get turf dancing? Okay. Like, come on, you know, <laughs> but On top of that, it is so important to also be able to make sure that all of the people of Oakland in one way or another are able to be economically empowered. Yes, Uh, and you know, like it is, it's still Asian um, APA, APIA month, you know what I mean? And um, an overlooked or an under-resourced and under-resourced community is the API community here in Oakland. Lots of, um, lots of Nepali, uh, lots of Middle Eastern, mm. lots of um, Southeast Asian and um, Oceania artists and mm. cultural workers are in Oakland. And so part of my job is to also make sure that um, I mm. have my ear to the pulse of those communities. And I'm making sure that I'm helping to create a space at the table so that those voices and their needs are also met and heard. And um, yeah, so, yeah. you know, yes, happy well, to be as a part of it. All see- Uh, Mush is the perfect person for us to talk to today Uh, based on her expertise, based on the work that she already does, based on her ability to just be enriching uh, the world and society uh, about culture. But more importantly, for this purpose of this conversation, right, you have amazing titles, you have an amazing body of work, but you are also an OG K-drama fan. Come on, girl. (laughs) K-drama. Everyone. (laughs) <laughs> Everyone is new to the Hallyu wave, but you've been riding it since like way back. So you are the OG. Since 1994. Right. So is it as addicting for you as a Korean American and as an OG fan as it is for the rest of us? Girl, yes. <laughs> and Do why? you see the men's and you see how fun the men's <laughs> is? Um, <laughs> Yes, I, you know what, as I was thinking about this, I don't think I've, Ruby, I don't think I've ever thought so deeply about K-drama as <laughs> I have this week because I had to get like, to the bottom of it. I was so obsessed. I'm like, why am I so emotionally invested? And I really had to get to the bottom of it. And so here you are. Yes. And so I also went to the bottom with you because I wasn't <laughs> going to let you go alone. So I went ahead and I put my little, you know, K-drama life vest on and then I went into the depths of the K-drama ocean. Um, it's, it's, I was thinking about this and, and look, first off, every, for anyone that's watching, I am a non-authority. Like I, all I do <laughs> is I watch and I happen to be Korean. That's it, okay? But I and wanted to know like, cultural context too. That's why I wanted to bring you on. And every once in a while, if I do my makeup right, I might look like a K-pop star in my dream of dreams, okay? Maybe. I we can make that happen. Girl, but you it is. It's so addicting. I love K drama. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized this is the reason why I feel like Western films, especially Western rom coms um, or romantic dramas, are they're just not satisfying. They fall short. 
and they just they don't they don't light me up in the same way that k drama mm-hmm. does and k rom-coms do and it's probably because i started watching k dramas with my parents along you know when as a kid right. and i was probably taking in parts yeah. of the storytelling that I, without even realizing it like there's such a deep emotional arc and it's, it just resonates so well. like so yes it's addicting for me there's so much context there's so many concepts and like words and emotions that I can't translate in English. Right. So I so, watch for that. Yeah. So if you can, you said that there are a lot of things about K-dramas that uh, capture and captivate you in the way that Western movies don't. Do you feel like there are certain specific elements that you could potentially identify as to the reason why that is? I mean, yes. There are two that I can come up with. And three, and the third is always going to be that the men's is fine. The oh. men are just beautiful. I'm always going to rep that, okay? Oh, I'm always I'm there with rep- you. I'm, I'm there. I'm going to rep you. Korean men up and yes. down, left and right, all day to the day I, I die. I think the whole world is like repping Korean men right now. <laughs> yes. Um, I just have so much love and so much pride for my culture, my people, and uh, particularly Korean men. I, I've always had a soft spot in my heart for them. Um, the thing that there are a couple of things. Okay. So, first, and anyone who watches K drama can probably identify as soon as I say it. So, they, if you watch, if, even if you've watched one K drama, you know that they, there's like an original soundtrack thing. Like in American films, there's like one theme song, right? Or right. one soundtrack anthem. And it's like, oh, you would associate that song with that film. In Korean movies, there have, there are like three. They're like, and it's like, it, it and they kind of match the emotion. So there's one like joyful, exciting song that will be playing mm-hmm. again and again. So in a, like a hundred series or a hundred episode series, you'll always hear these three same songs come back and get. Okay. There's one that's like a like a a, um, a sad, dark kind of you go inside yourself. Like it's it, they they're foreshadowings too. Oh. It's like you hear the song and you know, oh. oh shit, he is going to get cancer. Oh my god. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> or like so oh my. It's always cancer. Well, it used to be in the 90s. Um, but yeah, it was so it was always like, oh my God, it's either that person is going to find out they have cancer or, oh my God, that person's going to fall in love, realize that they have fallen in love with a blood relative. So it's something like that. There's like a, um, yeah, a, a, a foreshadowing through the music. And then there's um, just like a sweet love song where whenever the like protagonist or the two main people come together, it's like, oh, it's a feel good song. So that's really, I feel like that's really interesting and unique. Korean filmmakers play with music really well Mm -hmm. and they understand that there are like strands of emotions and they play to those again and again. And I feel like it's, I'm getting like really deep with it, but I feel, or maybe I, I feel like I am, but I feel like it's like a, it's like polyphonic. It's like multiple sounds all happening at once. And that mm-hmm. leads me to the second thing, which is like what I love about Korean film and Korean drama in particular is that, you know, like in Western film rooms, they have like set genres. It's like sci-fi. Yes. You have your, like, if you go to Netflix, right, you'll have like, now even Netflix is getting really creative with the way they categorize and label films, which is fun. Um, like, Films with a strong superhero lead or a female lead or, you know, um, films for indie pop kids or whatever. Um, Korean, like Western films have really cut and dried genres, like, you know, action, thriller, uh, paranormal stuff. In Korean films, they bleed all of that together. I, you know, there are experts who can speak on it way better than me, but what I see is that there's like paranormal activity meets the notebook right meets a lot meets, of cross genre <laughs> yes but it works like, and it's yeah and it's not even like a genre yeah it's like a mixing it's always some romance something right and there's always some type of family yes issue or secret that's being unveiled <laughs> and then there's always uh like a health <laughs> issue <laughs> yeah and and as of late there's like more paranormal stuff happening so it's like all of these 
I love that. So it's weird. It's fantasy and it's hard to pin down. And I, I love that. Well, I, I just wrote this blog piece about my reflection as a newbie to the K drama scene. Right. And as I, I mean, it got like a thousand likes on Instagram, which is like, I mean, I'm, I don't have, you know, I'm not like a 10,000 K follower kind of girl. So like, I was so, so surprised that this one post got that many likes. So I'm like, wow, everyone is, everyone is really um, interested in this. And I got these DMs. God, you validated all my feelings. And I'm like, wow, people are really getting (laughs) with this. Like, wow. They were like, oh my God, those are my truths. I was like, wow. Okay. I want to know what. So one of the things that I noticed is that um, one, the story arc is pretty masterful. Like they'll seed something in episode one, then episode seven, it like comes into full bloom and it's like a mic drop and it's like, whoa, you know? So then it like leaves, it kind of gives you this and then And I just don't really see that in Western storytelling that much. And then also we have, as Asian Americans, I mean, I have been starved for um, films that represent my upbringing. And even though I'm not Korean, right? Like I'm Filipino and Chinese. So there's a lot of, you know, overarching Asian values that Mm -hmm. are very familiar, both in the family and our culture. And so I think the subtlety of those, uh, you know, elements are present in K-dramas and I never really noticed that those were missing in like Mm. you know the western Hollywood blockbuster films until I watch it I'm like oh my god that's like really familiar and that's touching a very deep place in my heart (laughs) um yes and then of course right like the men's I mean we were so starved for fine Asian representation in media. And I mean, it, it just the last two or three years, we were starting to get a little bit more, but this is like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> like we were not ready. What is it, this. Ruby? What is it? What is it? <laughs> what am I saying? Is it whoa or is it whoa, 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 whoa? It's whoa, 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 whoa. whoa, whoa. It, it's like <laughs> whoa times 100 because I mean, I, I told you the Philippines is like going buck wild over K dramas, and I think it's been happening for a while. Crazy to me! It's absolutely nuts. It's like the quarantine has escalated this K drama phenomenon, but also like right, more and more people are realizing, oh my god, yeah, these Korean men are—they got something else. And as someone who's never really had a lot of exposure to Asian lead actors with very empowering mm-hmm. and heroic roles. That Mm -hmm. I think was more of the, you know, that's where the wow element comes in. But I think Mm -hmm. what everybody wants to know, there's all these important deep questions that I want to ask you, but what everybody wants to know who's tuning in right now, (laughs) Mush, is it real? Like, are the men really that fine? Like if we go to Seoul tomorrow, are we going to see fine men on the streets? Girl, you are asking a super (laughs) biased, it is so subjective. Yes, and yes, (laughs) and yes, 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 and yes. Yes. I mean, yes, they are fine. But let me go ahead and yes, that's the short answer. Yes, every, yeah. I mean, Korean men, you're just fine. Like, (laughs) what do you want me to say? Everybody is beautiful. However, so in Korean love stories, right, there's also, I think what people are entertained by as well is like the way the romance unfolds, you know, the Korean mm-hmm. men are often depicted in very chivalrous, um, you know, mm-hmm. captivity of crazy, uh, or I'm sorry, of crash landing on you is a very big yes. character that people are watching. He's so chivalrous. He's so protective over Sari. And, um, you know, and I think in comparison to modern day courtship, right? I mean, I live in France. I have not dated anything in America in a long time. So I don't know what's going on there. But I I think people are curious to know if, you know, uh, these love stories are somehow a reflection of, you know, potentially Korean culture and how they view love and relationships. And as someone who's both Korean and American, where do you, where do you fit in with those two mm you know, perspectives on love and relationships? That's such a, it's such a great question. I, I have to say that Korean culture, particularly just watching the men in my family too. So, but also those kind of attitudes and behaviors between my mom and my dad, my uncles and my aunts and my grandfather, and my grandma, those same kind of um, gestures of love and affection and tenderness, seeing that reflected in K-dramas, I feel like that has really shaped the way that I, understand 
mm. um, relationship and ro- like romantic relationship in particular. And I, that's probably honestly why it's difficult for me to date, especially in the modern world where things are faster than they've ever been. There's like an, a, a desire for instant gratification. You know, we've got all of the dating websites and stuff. Um, but there part of me that, and maybe this is a little sentimental, But part of me is, or overly sentimental, but part of me really loves, um, there's a big emphasis in Korean culture on platonic love Mm. as the foundation. And I think that to me is really missing in Western culture. And so people are like, and when I was in college watching dramas, like I loved it because I would have to like, I'd have to, back then it was like VHS. So I would have to go to literally, cause you know, we had blockbusters growing up, right? But I, Korean before DVDs and streaming stuff, I would have to go to Koreana Plaza. Oh my God, that Korean is Korean so supermarket. Right. Rent VHS tape. And I would have to rent, they would only let you rent seven at a time. But if you know Korean dramas on VHS, it would literally be 119 VHS tapes. So I would have to take seven at a time, watch them and return them, re- rewind them, and then take the next seven until I got through the series. But I would be so frustrated because I would have to wait like seven, you know, seven hours essentially <laughs> before I could get to the next conversation <laughs> between these two lovers. <laughs> and now looking back on it, I, I actually really love that. Sometimes I have to like fast forward because it's like, girl, just kiss him or girl, just touch his <laughs> pinky finger. I don't, I don't have three hours <laughs> for you to, you know what I mean? To, to like smile back. So that part can be frustrating, but there, it's also really beautiful to me um, because there's that buildup, like the foundation, at least to me when I watch it, it's like the foundation is something deeper than sex, lust, and mm-hmm the purpose of like getting married even like Korean dramas there's such an emphasis on like right you don't move in together before you're married you don't sleep together before you're married right um at least the external narrative but of of course it's different when in real life but that that to me is what I hold on to and that's what I look for and it shapes my kind of the way that I approach dating too it's like I want a foundation of friendship and There's just something so beautiful about savoring the little moments. Because when you do finally see homegirl like brush his arm intentionally after 13 hours, (laughs) you're like, you like 13 episodes in and she finally like acknowledges you as a human being. It it does because there's that great buildup. Right. We have been like really invested. So we're in, we're in, we're in. So that one brush means not just like oh my god they they connected but it means so much right who knew the friendship is developed hot and bothered over an arm brush after like 13 episodes it's it's incredible I love that I I love that though and I think that's what's missing from western film and western kind of um, romance narratives so tell me a little bit more about that platonic culture um, in romance, uh, in real life, uh, because I think right now, um, as you said, right, like there is so much confusion and complexity around male and female or female to female or same sex relationships. Um, Mm -hmm. And people don't know what they're doing, but maybe we can take a little bit of lead from this platonic culture and what we might be able to learn from it. Like, <laughs> be friends, you right? Know? <laughs> make friends. It's good to make friends, everyone. Um, I mean, what can we learn from? I'm thinking well, about what I've learned. Well, you said that you've watched your your dad. Uh, how your mom and dad are? Um, is the concept, for example, of chivalry still alive in Korean culture? The way that it's portrayed in K dramas. Absolutely. In real life, like uh, there are still kind of that there's still a notion that um, the dominant kind of person or the masculine role, the male in the relationship um, is responsible for protecting, caring for and accommodating the woman Mm -hmm. or. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And you see a lot of those things, those gender roles being blurred more now. Yeah. Um, with same sex kind of uh, characters and roles and about um, kind of gender fluidity too, which is like amazing and 
that to me is transformed. That's, that's a huge freaking deal. And even um, K dramas about single moms who yeah. aren't trying to marry up. K dramas right. about single moms who are hustling. They're going to own their own bar, which is like, you don't do that. First of all, <laughs> first of all, and then, and then she has this friendship and she's not trying to date this. I'm talking about um, where the camellia blooms. It's on Netflix. I believe it's amazing. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, all of that to say it's, it's still there. It, you'll go to Korea. And I think this is what I love about Korean men, at least the ones in my life and the, and this, the few that I've dated and they're amazing or incredible. Yeah. Um, is that there is still that sense of like chivalry and um, not necessarily like I'll open the door for you, although that's, you know, very, that's um, kind of a given too. Um, but this idea that like, I'm going to protect, not that you need it, but I'm going to, I'm going to take your lead. Maybe that's what it is. It's like chivalry that is, gentle and that is that surrenders does that make sense it does it's not like a it's not like an aggressive dominant harping chivalry it's like one that says you know what I'm gonna do like this instead of like right yeah yeah. I don't it's only gestures are gonna describe it but it's um and that's what I love too because Korean women are sassy and that's what I love about k-dramas because they portray that Korean women are we're boss. Yeah, I definitely see that. And I think what I really enjoy is that, for example, in Itaewon class, um, there are two lead female characters, and they may not necessarily have the most flattering characteristics, but they're both running stuff. Like one of them Hmm. is like, the reason why the business takes off the other one like holds like a big leadership position and i noticed that in a lot of dramas the women have leadership roles um so i was curious to know if that has always been the case in you know in korea and it, what is the reality of like female uh, roles in like korean society hmm great question i think you know i start my assessment is, and I've been watching Korean dramas now for at least 20, 25 years. And when I, if I kind of trace the arc of the stories, what, from what I remember, women have always in these K dramas and K rom coms, they've always had the emotional advantage, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. They've kind of held the power. If it's a, if if it's a romantic movie, mm-hmm. um, they do hold the power. There's like spunk, there's a lot of sass, there's a lot of kind of motivation and determination that Korean women are portrayed as having, which is real life. If you know my mom, <laughs> it's a real thing. But what I'm, but the narrative used to be Korean women, uh, we are all of this, we're, you know, we're ambitious, but we're not, we don't have any like positional power or mm-hmm. economic power. And mm-hmm. I want to strive to marry into mm-hmm. um, the wealthy family or the wealthy guy over there, but I'm like the assistant at the corporate office or I'm just like the delivery girl. And there's this really kind of, there's this trope of like, oh yeah, the working class girl who's super pretty and super unassuming will get with the wealthy CEO, right? Uh Or marry into their family. Now what I'm seeing, which, which is so refreshing is that there, it's less about class and more about women's just your ambition and personal dream. Mm. So you'll have women who are like working class, single moms, um, or a rookie historian, which is another K drama. Um, it's about the first female historian that worked in the royal palace. Mm. Um, and you know the, the romance is like second is like the second narrative, but the primary storyline is about her ambition and her drive and wanting to break barriers. Um, and to me, that's revolutionary in, in K-drama. Like that doesn't, like yeah. we don't need a man. We love the man. Yeah. Like, it's no longer about scaling economically, you know, mm. upward mobility. It's not like I'm gonna marry in or, right. um, but more of that is, also, is, is happening too. Like women are the CEOs and the roles are kind of re- reversed. Yeah. Almost 180. So like the woman is the CEO and the man is like, an assistant or maybe not as a high of a position right. um, and he falls in love with her or vice versa so there's that like perfect 180 flip of the narrative but then there's also some really complex things where it's like the woman no longer cares about upward mobility 
Mm. like social mobility. Right. She's about figuring out how do I honor my dreams mm. and how do I not, um, how do I not fit and conform into this world, in, into Korean culture in this world that says I have to be married and I'm like useless if I don't have a husband. Mm. And now, or if I'm not working in corporate America. So that, t- that to me yeah. is super tight. Do you think that it is a direct reflection of the transition happening in Korean society right now? Absolutely. And, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's been a, a culture shift and it's like with the new generation, I, you know, it's also a lot of globalization and a lot of access right. to cultures, Western culture, frankly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Well, yeah, the other question that I have for you connecting this kind of uh, new stance of women being empowered, but also chivalry, do you personally think that you could be a feminist, but also appreciate chivalry at the same time? Can can I be a feminist and appreciate chivalry? I think so, because I I don't see chivalry as being determined by gender or sex. Yeah. I can be chivalrous. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, the word, sh- it, what is the actual definition? If we were to look up the definition, really, what is sh- chivalry? I mean, I, I can't look it up myself right now because I have, I'm tied up with the screens, but I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. Yeah. And I'm asking because I had a very recent conversation uh, basically telling me that those two ideas conflict one another and I was appalled. Um, so mm-hmm. I just thought I'd get your take on it. You know, I mean, this is not necessarily about K-dramas, but like the themes that are surrounding it. And I think this is also like an interesting conversation that I think people are thinking about because uh, dating culture is so complex and s- people don't, don't yep. know exactly what to do anymore. It's such a, it's such a good question. It's, I mean, my answer obviously is yes. I think you can be chivalrous. You can, um, and it's, I'm looking up chivalry and it's about the medieval knightly system. (laughs) So I don't know, girl. That's what we're looking for. Noblemen and horsemen and a readiness to help the weak. So, I mean. That's not it. But how I would describe it really is just courtesy. It's like a very like attention to courtesy. Yeah, I think it's, you know, more than chivalry. Cause I do, when I hear the word, it, it, there's kind of like a, a weird uh, that I get uh, because it feels like at least in my mind though, that definition, the definitions are so rigid. It's about right. this gen- specific gender roles. But when I think of chivalry, I think of thoughtfulness and, and just a, a self-awareness but a yeah. self-awareness in service of somebody else. To me, that's chivalry. And I think that is absolutely, isn't that what feminism is? Yes. It's like you understand your positionality in the world and that it impacts the person next to you and that they, if you can, you use that in order to empower and create space for that person in their lives and their experiences. So to me, both, yeah, both is about making space. Uh, one is about making space and the other is about understanding your space and stepping into it as well, like mm-hmm. stepping into the power. So I think it can exist. And, th- you know, the romantic in me, Ruby, because, you know, I'm a romantic girl. Oh, so am I. And I'm a little bit old fashioned in some ways. I'm very, I think I'm very modern, but I, there are a lot of things about like the old fashioned, you know, kind of uh, ideas of chivalry that I think are still uh, relevant in modern society. I think it's like we're there, it exists too. And you and I are both poets and we come from like a school of thought where it's just because it's not happening in the dominant narrative or the mainstream story mm-hmm. about what r- romantic relationships look like today doesn't mean that there isn't an entire movement of it actually where these ideals of being, you know, equal, um, being an activist or having a feminist stance, but also being loved and being able to love freely right. wow. um, and safely, those things can all exist, right? Yeah, yeah. But I, I feel like it's, it's tricky because everything, our culture wants to move so fast for everything. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the hard thing about dating. It's like, oh, well, if I can get a response to this tweet in like three seconds, then I should absolutely be able to find somebody who can you know, wife me up or I can wife them up or I can husband them up or whatever. I could partner you up. 
um, in a week or in 30 days, right? And so we have shows like the 30 day or 90 day fiance or whatever. It's like this time constraint that gets placed on something that takes 112 episodes to build. Right. And that's what I also really appreciate about the K-drama style of storytelling. It, it is a very slow burn. And a lot of like crucial elements to a relationship are established before any physical connection happens. And I think that that is a, such a big lesson to be able to take on and to adapt into our own lives. Um, mm. But yes, I, I want to talk about it because I know that a lot of people are so um, entrenched in the love stories. So trying to figure out like what's real, what isn't, what can people like really expect you know, because I feel like people are like learning Korean now. They're trying to book their next trip okay. to school. Like I literally had yes. people write to me, um, you know, people from all over the world, like because of this, um, the blog post that I did that was like, I'm learning Korean right now and I really want to move to Seoul. And I'm like, wow, that's incredible. Wow. But also wanting to make sure that we're discerning what is real and what expectations are fair to have. Mm, that's super fair. I think that's, if there's one little snippet or one lesson that we can take away that I from K dramas and yeah. K Korean storytelling in general and cinematography I think it's it's that it names the importance of having a foundation to any relationship there's like a it's the foundation of eros or the foundation of strong friendship or familial bond before um sex and lust and um even titles like marriage and I think that's I, I love the build. There's something about the slow build and intentional building towards something that you want to create in your life that to me is like a great metaphor. It's like, yeah, you want the job of your dreams. Yeah, you want the relationship of your dreams or yeah, you want the house of your dreams. It's going to take you 112 episodes, just like it took yeah. Sister Girl to marry men or Sister Girl to say, you're not the one for me. Brush so the arm brush. <laughs> the, the arm brush so like if you I want my arm brush and my arm brush is like um I want that new whip or I want the, the arm brush is like I want to move to Singapore and start a whole new business and and thrive and be abundant it's going to take 112 episodes yeah. it's not going to be like a 140 character tweet I love that metaphor, Mush, because I think that you're right, that so many people are expecting so much instant uh, gratification, instant results. And I think what's getting lost in this generation is that process takes time, you know, like everything. Yeah. That's the biggest myth of like, that's the biggest myth of capitalism and capitalism mixed with globalization. I know these are big words, but <laughs> capitalism technology basically making money mm. and making money fast and getting somewhere in life like all of the and, and mass media it's like we see these images and we're here we're told these messages that things can happen quickly right like mm. our attention span is at two minutes so if you're going to make a youtube tutorial you better make it under two minutes it, it better be 170 seconds right. or else you're going to lose your audience right but what doesn't we don't see is on the back end the hours it took to set up your home studio mm. the hours it took to get your lighting right and the hair right because one one wrong thing and that's going to distract your entire audience so every little piece has to you know your setting is perfect and then you got to edit it and color correct and sound correct so there's so much on the back end that I feel like we don't share uh, when it comes to being successful or having an ambition and, and achieving and striving for it, making it happen. It's the work. Yeah. yeah. Um, and some of that gets shown in K-drama, that the slowness and mm. the pro that part, there's, oh. there's something in there. Yes. Again, like referencing my favorite one, which is Itaewon class. I mean, the main character is building a business, but he fails so many times in the, you know, the, the arc of the 16 episodes. And you could literally see the buildup. And I feel like even in Western movies, things happen so fast, like it's like a fairy tale. And so I, what I love is that this, these shows break down process. Um, mm. and I mean, I, I just, I don't know much like K dramas, K culture. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. I have just like, I am getting way more than what I bargained for. <laughs> so many <laughs> of course, to, to, to really take in. 
And uh, I mean, the culture thanks you. The culture embraces you. The culture loves wow. you, welcomes you in. Well, we are all, I think the whole world right now has their eye on South Korea. Um, I mean, you know, Parasite won, you know, mm -hmm. best picture at the Oscars last year. Yes, they uh, And, you know, I'm just curious from your perspective, because there are a lot of different archetypes, right, that kind of repeat themselves in Korean dramas. Mm -hmm. Uh, for, I don't know how to say it um, correctly, but I'm seeing the word che, che ball. It's like, it refers to like a wealthy CEO or like an heir of a CEO. It's spelled C-H-A-E-B-O-L. But anyway, it's like this archetype that is, um, you know, really wealthy CEO or like the heir of a wealthy CEO. That's yes. current. Yes. But it's always, it's, it, it's both male and female. So that's interesting. Yes, yes. And then yep. there's also the soldier that happens a lot. So, <laughs> you know, me- We're people of war. What's that? We're a people of war. Oh. I want your audience to know this too. Yeah. Korea is, we take great pride in never having been ever in our history of existence as a people and culture. We've never instigated or initiate or waged war mm -hmm. on another community. Wow. or nation and so there's something really to me um beautiful and significant about how that shapes our narrative and our understanding of how we tell stories about ourselves to our to ourselves but also to the world about who we are as yeah. a people i think that's something to watch for too for anyone who wants to get deeper that's watching that wants to get deeper into understanding the history and the lineage and the psychology of why Korean storytelling is the way it is you got to understand the history of our actual country mm. and in our in the stories of survival and the stories of um you know intentional decisions mm. on how to wage and, and stand in our power mm. yeah Can so you that there's that piece yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like maybe one kind of historical thing, because for example, in Crash Landing on You, um, it's a love story about a woman from South Korea who accidentally ends up in North Korea. And I, until that point, I had no idea that North Korea and South Korea weren't able to speak to one another. Like if you're in South Korea, oh. there's no communication. So can you maybe give a little bit of insight as to that piece of history to help us understand why there's such a distinct separation? Yeah, so they're in 19, I mean, basically just, what is it, 50, 60, just 70 years ago. So my grandparents were born, uh, my grandfather was born 1922, and he was born into what is called, what was called, in, in some people still refer as Choson, which is like a united Korea. Mm. So it's like, you know, it, it's like the, the, the US, imagine it being divided right down the middle. And there's like, the Western US and then there's like the Eastern US, but before 1950, there wasn't. So Korea before that had been occupied by Japan for 40 years. And so a lot of our cultural identity and footprint and all the kind of cultural indicators, our name, our language, our customs, our foods, all of that was forcibly um, taken away. It was erased and eliminated from the culture. But when we gained our independence, um, there was a war for that to happen. So there was a war between what is now the North, what is now North Korea, and that's the 38th parallel, that the DMZ marks the 38th parallel, yeah. um, and that's the North. And then the South is below the 38th parallel mark. Um, and it was, uh, I think the war ended in 1953. Um, my parent, my dad and mom were born two years after the war in 55. And so after that, you know, the US backed South um, started uh, its own government with its own US appointed leader. So that was a, a South Korean um, democratically led country. And then the North was a communist backed um, dictatorship, mm. military dictatorship. And after that, there was, it was just, a, it's like a huge sibling rivalry. So there are movies that are about that. There's one movie that where it's about two brothers and each brother represents, wow. it's like a, their metaphor for North, North Korea and South Korea. And there's, you know, lots of like independence movements about like, will the two come together? Can the two come together as one? But yeah, so, the, you know, there's, how do we talk about, oh yeah, so we, you can't, it's, it's a private state where, um, it's a military dictatorship, so we can't visit North Korea. Um, 
you can't email or communicate with anyone. In fact, there's a lot of um, the modern day underground railroad is wow. one that comes through out of North Korea and into China. Mm. Um, yeah, so if you- so There are a lot of, yeah. If, you, if your family got split up, for example, and some ended up in one side or the other, there would be no possibility to have contact. But is there, uh, but, but then could you say, hey, oh, well, I guess you won't be able to contact each other, but you could be like, hey, let's meet in, for example, in Crash Landing on You, they met in Switzerland. <laughs> um, so I guess that could be possible, but if there's no communication, how could you really set that up? <laughs> and you can't travel outside of the country. So it's like you being in France and not being able to leave the country at all. Oh, wait. So if you're in South Korea or if you're in North Korea, you can't travel out of North Korea. Wow. That's deep. That's deep. And then we can't travel to North Korea. There are very few limited like tourist programs or like government kind of um, like nation building programs. Mm. where you can have us like Rodney, uh, Dennis Rodman. <laughs> uh, he went to North Korea on by invitation, right? But you can't just like an average citizen can't leave the country's borders. Wow. Um, yeah. Amazing. And we can't like just say, hey, let's go next summer and, and travel. Like, no. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So there are a lot of complexities and that's a good segue, yeah. right? The complexities of K culture. That's a good segue to my next question, which is, you know, yeah. what are some of the dark sides of, you know, K celebrity culture? Because um, people all over the world have all of these admiration for K pop stars and uh, K drama celebrities. But what is, you know, the whole story behind that? What are some of the dark sides? I mean, I am one Korean American girl. Um, what are the dark sides? Like every culture, and I'm gonna start with something that is broad because I really believe this. Like every culture, there is like the narrative that we push forward and the narrative that we want to tell ourselves, mm. right? Because it's a reflection of truth. It's a reflection of our survival strategies, but it's also a re reflection of hope. So even if it's not a perfect, even if our realities aren't perfect and they don't match the story that we put out in the world, whether it's through art or poetry or film, there is a, a, some of that is true because it represents the desire or where we want to be or mm. who we, how we'd like to be in the world, right? Mm. As people and not just, it's not just a facade. Um, but I think, so all, I think like all cultures, there's a lot of complexity and then there's part of it is what we want to be and part of it is, and then there's the reality of what, who we are, you know, when the camera lights are off. And, you know, what's fascinated me most about Korean drama, Korean movies and filmmaking is how there's so much lightness. Like, yeah, Parasite just came out, but that's, and in, the, in the early 90s, it was a lot of heaviness. Again, cancer was huge, war and separation. Those were like big narratives because we were just beginning to step onto the global stage. You know, Western countries were starting to pay attention to us. We were advancing um, in technology, Samsung, LG, all of these companies were, were starting to grow and have like a global voice and tenor. But, but the things that haven't really changed about the culture are that there's still strict hierarchies. So like the man is still expected to be the breadwinner. Yeah like the, that's the dominant, you know, the, the, the son will get, not always, but the son is expected to inherit mm. um, the family's property or business. Yeah. Again, not in all cases, but um, those things are still really strict. And that's probably why, you know, I thought about going back to, to see if I could live there um, and do some cultural work out there, but it's, it's difficult. It's still really, you know, I'm born in the Bay Area, born in San Francisco, raised in this country. I'm such an American girl. Yeah. Culturally, as much as I am Korean. Like I am so Korean. My friends say I'm some of I'm like one of the most Korean people they've ever met. <laughs> um, but it's so yeah, that's tricky and that's hard. And there's, you know, an emphasis. I'm sure some of your viewers know about like the plastic surgery culture. Yeah. 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 Um yeah, it's big. And I know that Ruby, you, you, you and I have talked about like the whitening products and the surgeries in uh, the Philippines, right? Yeah, There's like yeah. 
those products are really popular. Same is true in Korea. And in fact, Korea has become the number one plastic surgery capital. Um, yeah. I think it might even outbeat Beverly Hills, like L LA as wow. the, the place where people go outside of, from all over the world to get their plastic surgery done because it's affordable. Um, yeah. It's abundant. There are so many practices and private practices that are offering plastic surgery and they are apparently Korean people innovate when it comes to plastic surgery. So there's like the bone shaving, which is really popular. There's the sankapur, which is um, the double eyelid and of course the nose shaving, but there are all kinds of practices like uh, like the uh, uh, like the neck, I think the neck can get pulled back. You can put screws in your knees um, and grow your legs oh like centimeters or millimeters at a time just to gain a couple inches. But there are all kinds of really painful and horrific kind of measures that Korean people have initiated for the sake of beauty or for the sake of meeting these Western standards of beauty. That's incredible. And that part sucks. Yeah, yeah, no, that is definitely, you know, that's hard. It's also because it is similar also in the Philippines in terms of just wanting to aspire for Eastern or for European features or Western features. And um, yeah, that's definitely an important point uh, because I also know that um, a common Google thing is like, if, you go if, if you're looking at Google, people always ask like, you know, what did ex-celebrity look like before plastic surgery. So it's like, I feel like all of the celebrities have all gotten some kind of work done. Um, so we never really know what's natural and what isn't. Um, no, and I think that's a thing. Like, it's like you go through, there's like a mill, like a, a talent mill or a talent farm where you start really young. And it's like the Disney kids here, but there's like strict training in Korea where you go to like a resort or you go to like a like a boarding school for talent yeah. and cultivating talent and through there you are you know put on a strict diet you have to do all the plastic surgery and of course the talent company and agency they pay for it but that's like the price you pay for being right. for tutelage and getting trained to become like a superstar mm. um so I don't know that's that part is that part is hard I will say that there is a movement, there is kind of like this, the younger generations, there's like this, are starting to bring back the beauty of the indigenous Korean face. Amazing. So like, like a resistance towards getting Sankapur Susu, which is your double eyelid surgery. And um, a lot of models and a lot, a lot of fashion designers and filmmakers and actresses and all cultural figures who are really embracing like, oh no, it's beautiful to have what mm -hmm. in America is called the monolid, which is the no Sankapur. Mm -hmm. So like these thinner, narrow, uh, almond-shaped eyes, th that's beautiful. Let's not try to overdo it or uh, yeah. make it seem bigger. And to me, that's really beautiful because that is one of the distinct definitive features to me of Korean people that I love is the monolid or like, I, I just, it's yeah. the Korean eyes to me. Wonderful. Well, you're a storytelling strategist uh, or narrative strategist. Yeah. So I would love to know from your perspective, what can individuals, brands, and organizations learn from the way Korean storytelling is done to incorporate it, to make, um, you know, stickier stories or emotionally connected stories? Hmm. I love, um, I love the build. When I talk about storytelling and I, I love the arc and the process, I when I talk about storytelling to whether it's an individual leader or if it's an organization, there's all about scaffolding and experience. So if you're in a boardroom or if you're talking, um, let's say you're doing a keynote presentation or let's say you're performing, if you're an artist, there's always gotta be an arc. You're bringing somebody on the journey. So that, that to me, is what Korean storytellers are masterful at, at building a slow arc and an intentional arc um, to the point where we are invested. So like, yeah, 17 episodes in, I'm in and I'm gonna go for another 23. You want that same thing as a speaker. Mm -hmm. You wanna be able to capture your audience attention pretty quickly, but you, so within the first, I always say within the first two minutes to 90 seconds, so that they are invested in you 
And you can then at that point, after the 90 second, 120 second mark, you can take them on a real journey. But Mm -hmm. that kind of instant is where we are, you're going to captivate your audience or you're going to lose an audience. And Mm -hmm. I think Korean storytellers are really good at doing that immediately. Mm -hmm. Even if the arc is really long, even if it's like a hundred episode thing, there's something in the beginning that's unique, that's kind of quick and that places you in a, in a context where you don't want to look away. Mm. And so now I'm bought, I'm in. So, okay, you have a, you have 300 episodes, I'm in. Cause you got me, whether it's, whether it's the charisma of the protagonist or whether it's an unexpected friendship or like just a, a closeness that you see between man and woman, mm. between, you know, childhood friends or whether it's like like a dreamscape montage, you go back and forth right from the beginning, there's this air of mystery, like what's happening? What, what? They have these little techniques that, that capture us. And I think the same thing is true for organizations and leaders. You have to capture the attention through some type of cultural or um, flashpoint. Mm, 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 I love that. Thank you. Well, I have one last question. Yeah. We're running out of time here, but I have one last question. And we're going to, I love that we're going to be able to end with this. We've talked about how fine your people are. We've talked about how <laughs> handsome Korean men are, but really all Asian men in so general. Um, Ali Wong so has this quote that I keep referencing about how she's an Asian woman with an Asian fetish. Um, yes, girl. Right. And I think that we share that as well. So in your opinion, I've already voiced mine through my blog, but in your opinion, why is it important for us to celebrate our Asian men and their sex appeal? I mean, because you celebrate, if you love something, you want everyone to know about it. Right. You do. And if, if nothing else, it's a celebration of love. Mm-hmm. Like when you love a movie, when you love a book, when you love your job, or when you love this new person you're with, you want everyone to know, right? And I think that is what we do and when we're doing our best um, mm-hmm. at showing love to Asian men. It's like, dude, I love myself. I love, and, and you know, also as like this concept of allyship, it's like, look, when we get down to the real of it is like, nobody is going to rep you the way you rep your own people. Yep. And I have found in my, both my friendships and in my romantic relationships with Asian men, particularly Korean men, it's like, they like us, Ruby, as women, as API women, they also haven't had the same type of representation that they need of strong men. Of men who are diverse, of men who can be both fragile and strong and fierce um, and gentle and humble. All of these things, they know that they want to be in their hearts, just like we do. We want to be complex. We want to be accepted and understood as complex, both beautiful and also um, broken, right? In all of those ways. And I feel like that is, I take it upon myself to always love my Asian brothers and to be vocal about it because I never, you know, I don't mean to sound all trite, but you know, we never got that. We never were told, oh my God, Ruby, you're so beautiful. Come on, Panay Chinese, (laughs) Papa, like, yes. You know, not only are you beautiful, but let's go ahead and put the looks away for a second. Oh my God, you're so innovative. You're so entrepreneurial. Uh -uh. You're so insightful and thoughtful and you're so empathetic, all of these things. uh, do, these aren't messages that we're told right. as Asian people, as Asian children. And so for me, it's so important that they hear it from me. And, you know, you, you, ha- you have to have a, understand your place in the world and you have a platform, you know, you have yeah. as a writer, mm-hmm. as someone who's in the, in front of cameras and in front of audiences, um, I can relate to that. And so every opportunity I get, I have to, I don't take it for granted. I'm not up there because I feel cute that day. I'm up there because I am blessed to have 300 people in front of me and every opportunity I get to reaffirm that I love myself and that you should love me too, because that's not the dominant narrative. I'm going to take that opportunity and I'm never going to do it for myself. Our job as a people of color is to also empower and lift up those um, who are just to the right and to the left of us. You know what I mean? Just so my Asian brothers too, but also my, my black and Latinx sisters and my native sisters, my indigenous exactly. people, because we are connected. And in, in proximity, 
they're not me and I'm not them, but we're so close that it, I do see it as my job to always give voice and show love publicly and out loud mm. with great affection for Asian men because they don't get it enough. We don't get it enough. And what ends up happening is that we are, we buy into the idea that we are not enough for each other. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And yeah, I love to all of my Asian men. Yes. So and fun. we are both of us right here, right now. We're sharing all of that love um, to everyone watching. And uh, thank you so much, Mush. This has been such an amazing conversation. I know that a lot of people are going to get so much insight, so much inspiration from this. Thank you for celebrating um, K-dramas, uh, love and our community with me. And I appreciate you just taking time out of your day to be a part of this conversation. And I hope that more people know about you. So for those who want to know more about your work, where can they find you? They can find me at Instagram at Whole Story Group and also at www.wholestorygroup, W-H-O-L-E, story, S-T-O-R-Y, group.com. Thank you so much, Mush. And for all of those watching, thank you for joining us for this episode of Grit and Glamour, honest conversation about the grind toward the glow up that you don't see on the gram. So um, we'll see you again for the next episode. And until then, I'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Rubes. Thanks, everyone.